In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Laudato si, hoc me, Signore. Laudato si, hoc me, Signore. Sounds a little bit a Latin. Sounds a little bit of Italian. Well, in reality, it's kind of a little bit of both. Uh, that phrase uh, comes from a, an Umbrian dialect, uh, somewhere between the translation uh, of language between uh, spoken Latin and spoken Italian. It comes from the 12th century. It is the language, of course, used by Francis of Assisi, St Francis, whose day we celebrate today. Laudato si, o me, Signore. Praise be you, my Lord. Praise be you, my Lord, to our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us producing varied fruits and coloured flowers. Laudate, laudato si, o me, signore. So sang St Francis in his Canticle of Creation, the song of Brother Sun and Sister Moon. Laudato si is also the encyclical by Pope Francis, where he focuses most clearly on environmental issues. He took the name of his, his uh, encyclical letter uh, from his namesake's song. Uh, so you have uh, Pope Francis uh, borrowing uh, some words from Saint Francis, from whom, of course, he also takes his pontifical name. The pontiff writes, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. Now, while these are the words of Pope Francis, they could very well be the words of Saint Francis, because these are the things that Saint Francis was most passionate about, combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, while at the same time protecting nature, the, uh, the natural world. I had a question come to me on uh, Facebook through the week <clears throat> and the correspondent writes, excuse me, <clears throat> the correspondent writes, why banners of vegetation in your church? Why banners of vegetation instead of Christian subjects? So I responded to uh, the question on Facebook by, uh, uh, by uh, quoting St Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas comes just a little bit after St Francis in the 13th century. Uh, Creation, says Aquinas, is the primary and most perfect revelation of the divine. Creation is the most perfect and primary revelation of the divine. Now, Thomas Aquinas is arguably one of the, uh, the greatest minds in, uh, in the Western world, uh, in, especially in, in Christianity, one of the greatest theologians. So I never argue with Aquinas. <laughs> when questioned further by my Facebook correspondent, uh, I posted these words from uh, another Franciscan. Now, not the first Franciscan, St Francis, but another Franciscan friar, Father Richard Rohr. <clears throat> Father Richard writes, the first incarnation of God did not happen in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. That is just when the incarnation became human and personal for us and, and, and when many people started to take divine embodiment seriously. <clears throat> The initial incarnation, the first 
embodiment of the divine in, in physical form, the initial incarnation, actually happened 14 billion years ago in the Big Bang. That is what we call the moment when God decided to materialise and self-expose, at least in this universe. The first, the very first idea in the mind of God was to make divine formlessness into physical form so that everything visible is a further revelation of what has been going on secretly inside God from eternity. Love always outpours. God spoke the eternal word, the idea called Christ, and it was, we are told in Genesis. 2,000 years, 2,000 years ago, was the human incarnation of God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But before that, there was the incarnation, the taking on a physical form through light and through water and land and sun and stars and, and plants and trees and birds and serpents and cattle and, and fish and every kind of wild thing, according to Genesis, according to the creation story. The first incarnation, the first expression of divinity in physical form. So then my Facebook correspondent <laughs> uh, responded <clears throat> to my sharing of Father Richard's words by saying, I'm beginning to feel I need to apologise for being keen on Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter, the alpha and the Omega. Well, I suggested to my correspondent that there was absolutely no need to apologise for being keen on Jesus because we were rather keen on Jesus as well. Uh, as the Alpha and the Omega, as the divine word made flesh. But not just 2,000 years ago, uh, in Bethlehem, but when God said, let there be light, the divine word takes on human form. God said, God spoke, the word goes out and takes on physical form. God said, uh, let the, uh, the waters separate and the land. God said, uh, let us make animals and all the creeping things of the earth and cattle. And God said, let us make humanity in our own image. That very same divine word that speaks all the physical universe into being takes on form in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago as a little baby. God said, let there be. Yes, my friend on Facebook, we are very, very keen on Jesus. <laughs> we are very, very keen on understanding a bigger Christ. <clears throat> Again, Father Richard notes, for most of Christian history has heard little or nothing about this timeless mystery. And we settle for small tribal gods instead. We put Jesus in competition with other religions instead of allowing him to ground the universal search for God in the material world itself, in nature, in cosmos, in history. That is what incarnation teaches us that we ground our encounter with the mystery of God in all that is. In other words, 
All creatures are capable of knowing and loving God long before the world religions formalise themselves into, into doctrines and rituals. The natural world, with all its diversity and wonder, is, as Thomas Aquinas states, the primary scripture. And when we forget that, we cannot but use the other scriptures, the Bible, for tribal purposes. The tribal purposes of division and exclusion. When we forget that the natural world is the primary scripture, we can not help but to commodify the natural world and to exploit it for our own profit. Today's Gospel reading, <clears throat> the parable of the wicked tenants, is the third in, uh, in, in a series of, of four stories that Matthew has Jesus tell. And all of those stories begin with a phrase. There are uh, the four parables, the, uh, uh, the parable of the, of the vineyard, the, the parable of um, uh, uh, the ruler, the parable of today's parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, and finally the parable of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the son, uh, king's son's wedding. Uh, as we've noted before in this series, we, uh, they all start with a phrase. Uh, and this one is no different. This parable of the wicked tenants, the parable of the vine another parable of the vineyard, starts with the phrase anthropo oikodespote. In Greek, anthropo oikodespote. Anthropo is where we get our word anthropology from, it means human. So Matthew wants us to make sure we understand this is a, a human story. Uh, we're not to say, oh, this is kind of about God and God does this sort of thing. Matthew won't let us do that. Uh, this is about us. This is about human beings. This is the way we human beings behave one towards the other. This is a story about anthropo oiko despotes. Oiko is where we get our word economics from. Uh, it means household. Despote, we hear despot in there. Uh, the word despot gets a bit of bad press these days, but it, 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 it literally in Greek means uh, ruler. So this anthropo is uh, uh, a, a human uh, ruler of the household or, or ruler of the, the property. Uh, and so this is about us. And this, this story goes that this uh, ruler, this landowner, uh, has this land and builds it and, and puts these tenant farmers in charge and, uh, and they don't look after it. Uh, they are abusive not only uh, of the land itself but of uh, uh, the, uh, the land owner and the land owner's representatives. Now this particular story that Matthew has Jesus tell is actually a retelling of another uh, story from Isaiah chapter 5. Where in Isaiah chapter 5, the vineyard is clearly a metaphor uh, for the people of Israel. Now, Matthew's Jesus follows Isaiah's theme and applies this story to the religious leaders. His hearers know exactly what he's talking about because they know the Isaiah story. They know the Isaiah. As soon as they hear him talk about this, they say, Oh, we know what this is about. Uh, it was Isaiah telling off the leaders of Israel. Uh, saying that uh, uh, God's favour will be taken from them because they've been unfaithful to the covenant uh, and will be given to someone else. They know exactly, even before he gets to the end of the story, they know exactly where he's going with it. And we are told the religious leaders understand that he is talking about them. Of course they understand. They know what Isaiah said. They understand exactly what he's saying. He's saying that... God's kingdom is going to be taken away from you and given to somebody else. In this St Francis's tide, on St Francis's day, I want to take some of the prophetic dynamic of this story and apply it to our 
own. Matthew wants us to do that, a human landholder. He wants us to do this. He wants us to take the story and apply it to ourselves. And I want to take the story and apply it to our stewardship of the vineyard, our stewardship of creation. The word we translate in the parable as tenant farmers in Greek is Georges, Georges. And it's made up two of two words. Uh, the first uh, G-O part of that word, geo. Um, my son is a geologist. He studies the earth. Uh, the word means earth, georges. The second part of that word is ergon. It's the Greek word for work. So these Georges are workers of the earth. Now, I'm not a great fan of uh, the King James Version of the Bible. It made a lot of mistakes and, uh, and sometimes people hold it up to be something that it's not. But every now and then, you get a translation that is enormously helpful. And the King James Version of the Bible translate these tenant farmers with the old English word husbandman. It's where we get our word husbandry from. Uh, animal husbandry means to, to care for animals, doesn't it? Not. And I think that's a helpful insight into this word because this, this word of worker of the earth has the connotation to it. of Not only working the earth, not only profiting from that work, but also doing it in a sustainable, caring, even loving way. And these are wicked, Georges, because they have not honoured that. They have not cared for the earth. They have not loved it. They have not cared for it in a sustainable way. And we are told that they will be, their stewardship will be taken away from them and given to another. Matthew can be very harsh in the way he tells stories sometimes because he wants us to stop and to sit up and to take notice. This is a human story. If you are not good farmers, if you are not good your guests, then your stewardship will be taken away from you and given to another. Again, Pope Francis writes in Laudato Si. It must be said that some committed and prayerful Christians, with the excuse of realism and pragmatism, tend to ridicule expressions of concern for the environment. Others are passive. They choose not to change their habits and thus they become inconsistent with their gospel belief, whereby the effects of their encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationship with the world around them. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential, writes Pope Francis, is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional, optional or a secondary aspect of the Christian experience. It is a primary aspect of the Christian experience. If we think engaging the scriptures is a primary aspect of the Christian experience, it is, then we must recognise that the first scripture needs to be engaged with equal devotion, with equal prayerfulness, with equal faith. If we do not exercise our primary vocation as careful stewards of God's primary revelation, then this gospel tells us that our stewardship will be taken away from us and given to another. If only, if only we could learn to sing. Laudato si. Ho oh, me, Signore, to sing along with St Francis his canticle of creation. 
Praise be God, Lord, for Brother Son, who brings us each new day. Praise be for Sister Moon, white, beauty, bright and fair. With wandering stars she moves through the night. Praise be my Lord for Brother Wind, for air and clouds and skies of every season. Praised be for Sister Water, humble, helpful, precious, pure. She cleanses us in rivers and renews us in rain. Praised be my Lord for Brother Fire. He purifies and enlightens us. Be praised, my Lord, for Mother Earth, abundant source, all life sustaining. She feeds us bread and fruit and gives us flowers. Praised be my Lord for the gift of life, for changing dusk and dawn, for touch and scent and song. Praise be my Lord for those who pardon one another for love of thee and endure sickness and tribulation. Blessed are they who shall endure it in peace, for they shall be crowned by thee. Praise be God for Sister Death, who welcomes us in loving embrace. Be praised, my Lord, for all your creation, serving you in joy. Laudato si, o me, Signore. The Lord be with you.